Now at 10. I think, it, you know, the event with the president making any indication our people are fired up. The time for talk is done. Nine hours until the polls open for the most anticipated midterm election in recent memory. Plus. War veterans defend a placement of the monument they are building. Showers and storms to our west coming our way for tomorrow. I'm John Hart. This is News Channel 6 at 10 on MeTV. And we begin with breaking news and heartbreaking news out of Hepzibah tonight. A live look at Karen Way off of Old Waynesboro Road, where tonight the sheriff's office says a six-year-old child has been shot and killed. Investigators say they have a family member in custody. They are, they are questioning that person to determine if this was an accident or something else. Again, this investigation in the early stages, they have not released the name of the victim or the suspect, but again, a six-year-old child shot and killed on Karen Way in Hepzibah tonight. If we get any more information in the next half hour, we'll certainly pass that along to you. If not, be sure to keep checking WJBF.com and our Facebook and Twitter for updates. New at 10 tonight, the eve of the 2018 midterms. By this time tomorrow night, you will have chosen a governor, representation in Washington, and several other officials, and all the ads will be done. In Georgia, of course, the big race is for governor. A last minute bombshell as the Secretary of State's office announces an investigation into accusations that Democrats tried to hack a voter database. Of course, the Secretary of State also happens to be the Republican candidate, Brian Kemp, who stopped at Daniel Field in Augusta on this eve of the election. Ashley Osborne was there. Today, Brian Kemp tells News Channel 6 he's not wrapped up in poll numbers, but focused on turnout. And I think, it, you know, the event with the president making any indication our people are fired up. Kemp says if, if they weren't investigating, then the DNC would point the finger at him and say he wasn't doing his job. For her part, Abrams spent part of her day campaigning for last minute votes in Savannah, where she was obviously asked to respond to the accusations from Kemp. He ignored the warnings. He then made up a lie. Yeah, Democrats say it is a conflict of interest for Kemp to remain Secretary of State while running for governor, uh, but political experts tell us there is no law saying he has to step down. In the Palmetto State, incumbent Republican Governor Henry McMaster trying to fend off a challenge from Democrat step, uh, State Rep James Smith. Both spent their day crisscrossing South Carolina. Stetson Miller reports. The candidates in the South Carolina race for governor are making their final stops and trying to reach as many voters as possible on the eve of the election. And there is growing concern tonight about the uh, weather tomorrow and what effect that might have on turnout at the polls. So, of course, we turn to Chief Meteorologist George Myers tracking the situation in the forecast center. That's right, John. Right now, there's a line of strong to severe storms across the deep south. All right, George, President Trump and former President Obama, neither of whom are on the ballot tomorrow, by the way, but they are continuing to make last minute pitches to voters coast to coast uh, as Democrats try to wrestle control of the House and Republicans try to keep them from doing it. Karen Kafa looks at what's at stake nationally tomorrow. In the final hours of the midterm campaign, each party sending top names on the trail. And we will be with you all night tomorrow night on air and online. We will have reporters all across Georgia and South Carolina with updates throughout the night at WJBF.com on our Facebook page and at WJBF on Twitter. And of course, a complete recap with live reaction and analysis right back here tomorrow night. Same time, same bat channel, WJBF News Channel 6 at 10. New at 10, Augusta City leaders giving the go ahead for a local organization to build a memorial downtown that will honor Vietnam veterans. Devin Johnson is live in the newsroom with that story. Devin. All right, Devin Johnson live in the newsroom for us tonight. Devin, thanks. Tonight, Augusta City leaders are mourning the loss of Commissioner Andrew Jefferson. Jefferson died after collapsing at church yesterday. Just last week, he was offering his condolences to the family of Commissioner Grady Smith, who, of course, died less than three weeks ago. Mayor Hardy Davis says now is the time to think of Jefferson's family, not what is next for Jefferson's district. I want to encourage anyone who's thinking about it, uh, anyone who's considering, well, let me start. And the mayor went on to say uh, he wanted to, whoever's considering to put their name in the hat to stop those conversations now. He said this is the time once again for the community to put our arms around Jefferson's family members. Jefferson's funeral will be this Saturday at 1 o'clock at Good Shepherd Baptist Church. 
Oh yeah, I told you about the rain and possibly strong storms headed our way for election day tomorrow. Here is what it is doing in Louisiana tonight. At least one tornado reportedly touched down. This is in the area where Louisiana, Texas and uh, Arkansas sort of come together. Good news is local officials say no reports of any injuries, though a tornado watch is still in effect for that area. Now, your most accurate forecast. Thus completes the weather report. For you, George, we just throw out the clock. You're the best producer in the world. Uh, at 10 o'clock. <laughs> George, thanks. Sure. Uh, still ahead, we continue our salute to veterans this month with a special report on a local man who has an amazing story from World War II. Tonight, a News Channel 6 special report. Veterans Day is next week, and we'd like to introduce you to Dennis Trudeau, the former mayor of Grovetown. But before politics, he saw action in one of the biggest battles of World War II. But that's just the beginning. George Escola has his story. George Escola, WJBF News Channel 6. And still ahead, Georgia has already punched its ticket to the SEC championship game, but there is much work to be done before the dogs can even think about Alabama. King news, in case you were not with us at the top of the show, a six-year-old child shot and killed in Hepzibah tonight. This is on Karen Way. Investigators have a family member in custody. They're questioning that person to find out whether or not this was an accident. The victim's name has not been released. Another update when the news continues at the top of the hour on WJBF News Channel 6 at 11. Hogan's Heroes next here on... John Hart still live at the scene this morning where he has been for many, many hours. John, anything new to report today? Good morning, Mary. Yes, uh, we actually just finished a briefing with Brian Sterling, who is the director of the Department of Corrections. I have a lot of new information to run down, so let's go ahead and take a look at the scene from overnight while I tell you. Uh, he informed us that this all started late last night with a report of an inmate with a cell phone, and when officers went in to try to take that cell phone, the inmates rebelled. They were joined by inmates from other dorms, and they began to try to destroy their dorms. Officers took cover in a separate room. Uh, SWAT teams went in and performed two different extractions and were able to get those six officers out of the correctional facility. Two of the officers were injured, non-life-threatening injuries. Uh, no inmates were injured in the incident. Two small fires also broke out in the yard here at the facility. Those were put out. Uh, the director of the Department of Corrections tells us these problems with cell phones are the number one problem facing corrections officers these days. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't stop, it's not going to get any better. It is just a constant battle that correctional facilities and officers face. So uh, the inmates in question that injured those officers will be prosecuted. We are also told there is significant damage uh, to the dorms here at the correctional facility. So those are a couple of storylines we will continue to follow throughout the day here on News Channel 6. But for now, reporting live in Trenton, John Hart, News Channel 6. It's as routine as starting the car. Directions to 1001 Reynolds Street. Plugging your destination into your GPS. Starting route to 1001 Reynolds Street. But is saving minutes off your trip taking years off your brain? What we need to recognize is that, okay, this is affecting us in ways that we hadn't thought of before. Dr. Alexandra Roach is a professor of psychology at USC Aiken. If we're not doing things to help build the gray matter um, in our brain by, by challenging ourselves cognitively, um, then we're not really providing that, that base, that scaffolding that's going to help us in the long run. A British study found that when we start a trip, our brain naturally maps out a route. Turn right onto Mark's Church Road, then turn right onto I-20 East. But when we use our GPS, the brain doesn't do this. And over time, that can become a problem. Do you lose the abilities if you no longer practice them? And that, that's definitely going to be true. Dr. David Blake is a neuroscientist at the Medical College of Georgia at Georgia Regents University. Will that have some sort of uh, overall decline in, in cognitive ability as you age? And we know that within that one little milieu of cognitive ability, you will decrease. In other words, the more you use your GPS or your list of contacts, the more you'll lose the ability to read a map or remember a phone number. Keep right on I-20 East toward Columbia. We need to 
start looking at this as something that really is affecting us. There is this environmental impact on, um, on our brains and using this technology. The two parts of the brain most involved with our ability to find our way to a destination are also two of the first to be damaged in age-related dementia. A Canadian study found that over-relying on our GPS can lead to underusing these parts of the brain. Absolutely, there's a use it or lose it component to the brain. However, one realm of cognition is not going to have a huge impact on something like uh, decline into dementia, but rather it's really the full range of domains. Turn left onto River Watch Parkway. Just because we're relying on our, our GPS um, and we're not paying attention to our surroundings doesn't mean our hippocampus is going to atrophy. Um, we just need to uh, make sure that uh, we're stimulating our brains in other ways. We, we do need to be cautious about the introduced new use of technology. It, it, like I said, it's a wonderful new set of tools, but it has pros and cons. It'll be interesting to see, we won't know, as I said, for decades what the actual effects of all this are. Arrive. Turn right onto Wheeler Road. Okay, so using your GPS won't necessarily lead you to early onset dementia, but it can definitely be a factor. One realm of d cognition is not going to have a huge impact on something like uh, decline into dementia, but rather it's really the full range of domains. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, Vine, and what are we doing while we're looking at all this stuff? A lot of this multimedia tasking by its nature is a sedentary activity. Dr. Alexandra Roach is a professor of psychology at USC Aiken. She spent the last six years studying the effects of all this sitting around on the aging of the brain. What I find most disturbing is this increase in obesity. Mm -hmm. um, and the, ram the long-term ramifications of that, we know that already. And so that's one thing that we, we could focus on now, knowing, knowing the outcome. Long story short, sitting around packs on the pounds, which leads to obesity. Obesity is the number one cause of diabetes and if you have diabetes, you're more likely to convert from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease um, and, and dementia. So that is something that I think we, we can focus on as an issue that we really know how that could play out. And all these devices seem to be stressing us out. A recent Sussex University study showed that people who routinely stare at more than one screen at a time show increased risk of depression and emotional problems. We know there are certain forms of stress that are associated with internet use, especially uh, constant availability stress. Research also shows stress leads to increased levels of cortisol, a hormone released by the adrenal gland. Cortisol can lead to obesity, and obesity leads to, well, I think you know the rest. We're increasing their risk for vascular risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, um, and these have been shown in adults to have effects on cognitive aging. Simply put, the best way to keep your smartphone from making you dumber? You want to stay in shape, you want to stay thin, and you want to use your brain on a regular basis over a wide range of cognitive domains. It should just serve as a motivating factor for maybe reassessing how we interact with technology in our lives um, so that we can make sure that we're not um, putting ourselves at a disadvantage for later.